there's a medical revolution happening right now inside every one of us, and most people don't even know it's there. This revolution has the potential to transform how we treat, prevent, and even understand some of society's most feared diseases, including cancer. It all comes down to a single system in the body. Angiogenesis, the process that controls how blood vessels grow. I'm Dr. Angio, and today I want to walk you through the incredible story of how your blood vessels shape your health, how they can protect you, how they can fail you, and how understanding them gives us a completely new way to think about disease. If you'd like more weekly videos that break down complex health science in a simple way, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next one. Now let's start. What makes blood vessels so extraordinary? Your body contains about 60,000 miles of blood vessels, which is enough to circle the Earth twice. The smallest of these, your capillaries, number around 19 billion. These aren't just tubes delivering blood. They're incredibly dynamic structures that change depending on where they are. In the liver, vessels organize into channels to detoxify blood. In the lungs, they line the air sacs that allow oxygen to move into your body. In muscle, they twist like corkscrews so you can contract and relax without closing off circulation. And along your nerves, they act like power cables, keeping those cells alive. What's remarkable is that you develop almost all of these vessels before you're even born. As adults, we only grow new blood vessels in a few special situations. Building the uterine lining each month, forming the placenta during pregnancy, and healing wounds after an injury where vessels grow underneath a scab and race toward the center of the wound to repair the tissue. This ability to tightly regulate blood vessel growth depends on a beautifully balanced system. The body uses stimulators called angiogenic factors to grow new vessels when needed. And when those vessels are no longer necessary, the body releases natural inhibitors to prune them back. It's a constant balance. But like anything in biology, when the balance breaks, problems follow. So what happens if the body can't grow enough vessels? We see consequences like heart disease, neuropathy, limbs that lose circulation, wounds that never heal, and even stroke damage. On the other end of the spectrum, too many vessels can fuel diseases such as cancer, arthritis, blindness, obesity, and Alzheimer's. In fact, more than 70 major diseases affecting over 1 billion people worldwide share abnormal angiogenesis as a common root problem. These conditions may look unrelated, but deep down, they share the same imbalance. This new understanding has completely changed how we think about treating disease, and nowhere is that more clear than in cancer. When cancer begins, it doesn't start off as a large tumor. It starts as a tiny nest of cells, about the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen, or half a cubic millimeter. Without a blood supply, these tiny cancers can't grow any further. They don't have the oxygen or nutrients they need. What's fascinating is that autopsy studies have shown that many of us are forming these microscopic cancers all the time. In autopsies of women aged 40 to 50 who died in accidents, about 40% were found to have microscopic breast cancers. In similar studies of men in their 50s and 60s, about 50% had microscopic prostate cancers. And nearly 100% of people in their 70s have microscopic thyroid cancers. These are incredibly common, but they almost never become dangerous unless they acquire a blood supply. One of the pioneers of angiogenesis research referred to this as cancer without disease. The cancers exist, but the disease does not because angiogenesis has not turned on yet. But when a cancer cell mutates and gains the ability to release angiogenic factors, that's when things change. The balance tips. Blood vessels grow into the cancer, delivering oxygen and nutrients, and from that moment on, the tumor can expand, invade local tissue, and eventually spread to other parts of the body through those very same new vessels. Unfortunately, this angiogenic switch often happens long before we detect the cancer clinically. So, if angiogenesis is the tipping point between harmless and dangerous cancer, one major strategy has focused on cutting off the blood supply to tumors. This is where anti-angiogenic therapy comes in. Unlike chemotherapy, which attacks cancer cells directly, anti-angiogenic treatments target the blood vessels that feed the tumors. Tumor vessels are abnormal, poorly constructed, fragile, and leaky. So they're especially vulnerable to therapies that target them. When patients with gliomas or breast cancer receive anti-angiogenic drugs like Avastin, 
Imaging has shown dramatic reductions in blood flow around the tumours as these vessels regress. This concept has also been applied to animals with naturally occurring cancers. In one example, a nine-year-old boxer named Milo developed an aggressive tumour in his shoulder that had already spread to his lungs. His veterinarian gave him three months to live. Researchers created an anti-angiogenic cocktail, a mix of drugs that could be blended into his food along with a topical cream applied to the tumour. Within weeks, the tumour's growth slowed and Milo lived six times longer than predicted with a good quality of life. Over time, this approach has been used on more than 600 dogs with about a 60% response rate and significantly improved survival for many pets who otherwise would have been euthanized. The same principle was used to treat a dolphin with invasive squamous cell tumours in its mouth. A topical anti-angiogenic paste was applied three times a week and over seven months, the lesions disappeared. Biopsies eventually came back normal. In another case, a quarter horse named Guinness developed a deadly angiosarcoma on its lip. After six months of topical treatment and an oral anti-angiogenic cocktail, it achieved a complete remission and remained healthy six years later. This strategy has been applied to humans as well. In one study of patients with invasive squamous cell cancers on the skin, topical anti-angiogenic therapy alone caused tumours to regress by starving them of their blood supply. 94% of patients experienced this response without the need for surgery. This has since been used on hundreds of patients who are unable to undergo conventional surgical treatments. These results are impressive and anti-angiogenic therapies have now been developed for people. Today, 13 different drugs targeting angiogenesis are approved for 14 cancer types. In some cancers like kidney cancer, multiple myeloma, colorectal cancer and gastrointestinal stromal tumours, patient survival has improved by 70 to 100% since these therapies were introduced. But not every cancer responds as strongly and in many cases the improvement is modest. This raises an important question, why aren't the results even better? The answer, as stated in angiogenesis research, is that we often treat cancer too late. After the angiogenic switch has already turned on, and after tumours have already established their own blood supply and sometimes spread, once disease reaches an advanced stage, achieving a cure becomes far more difficult. This realisation led researchers to rethink the problem from the very beginning. Instead of waiting until blood vessels fully form around a tumour, they asked, can we prevent angiogenesis from ever flipping that switch? And to explore that, they return to one of the biggest environmental factors in cancer development. According to data, diet accounts for 30 to 35% of all environmentally caused cancers. The question wasn't, what should we eliminate from our diets? Instead, researchers asked, what can we add that naturally helps the body maintain healthy angiogenesis? They turned to foods, herbs, and beverages. Using a lab test designed to measure angiogenesis, they placed a ring of tissue in the centre of the test plate and observed hundreds of blood vessels sprouting outward in a starburst pattern. This allowed them to test dietary components at concentrations achievable through normal eating. When they tested extracts from red grapes, the active ingredient resveratrol inhibited angiogenesis by about 60%. Extracts from strawberries showed strong inhibitory effects. So did extracts from soybeans. Researchers built long lists of foods and herbs with natural angiogenesis inhibitors. And for each food, they found that different strains and varieties contain different potencies. This led to the idea that, if people are eating something anyway, why not choose the most potent version of it? One particularly interesting example involves green tea. Four common teas were tested. Chinese jasmine, Japanese sencha, Earl Grey, and a special blend designed by the researchers. Each tea had a different level of potency. But here's the fascinating part. When the two less potent teas were combined, the blend was actually more potent than either one alone. This is evidence of food synergy, where combinations of foods can create a greater effect than any single component. Researchers also tested common medications, like statins and anti-inflammatory drugs, that have been associated with reduced cancer risk. These drugs also inhibited angiogenesis. And when compared head-to-head -head with dietary factors, many foods performed just as well. Parsley, soy, garlic, grapes and berries all demonstrated significant anti-angiogenic effects in the lab. But the real question is always, does this matter for people? 
One of the clearest human examples comes from a study of 79,000 men followed over 20 years. The study found that men who ate two to three servings of cooked tomatoes per week had up to a 50% reduction in prostate cancer risk. Tomatoes are rich in lycopene, a compound shown to be anti-angiogenic. The study also found that among men who did develop prostate cancer, those who ate more tomato sauce had fewer blood vessels feeding their tumors. This is powerful evidence that angiogenesis modulating foods can influence cancer development in humans. Now, a logical question some people ask is, why not just eat 20 or 30 servings of tomatoes a week? We don't have data on whether extremely high quantities provide added benefit. What we do know is that the two, three servings per week used in the study were effective and realistic. Any dietary change has to be practical and enjoyable enough for people to sustain. Another question that often comes up is, why not just take a lycopene pill instead of eating tomatoes? Tomato extracts were compared to pure lycopene in experimental models, and even when lycopene was given at 10 times the amount found in tomato extract, the tomato extract still performed better at inhibiting angiogenesis and slowing tumor growth. This reinforces the idea of food synergy. Whole foods contain multiple components that work together in ways isolated supplements can't replicate. Let's switch gears a bit and explore angiogenesis beyond cancer, particularly its role in obesity. Fat tissue is highly dependent on blood vessel growth. In genetically obese mice, researchers observed that body weight tracks closely with angiogenesis. When the mice were given anti-angiogenic therapy, they lost weight. When the therapy stopped, their weight returned. When therapy resumed, weight dropped again. Interestingly, they could never drop below the weight of a normal mouse, which shows that angiogenesis helps maintain a biologically healthy baseline rather than allowing extreme weight loss. So where is angiogenesis research heading next? The goal is to build a detailed, evidence-based database for foods, varieties, and preparation methods. This way, consumers can make informed decisions. By assigning numbers and comparative effectiveness values to foods, researchers aim to help people choose ingredients that naturally support balanced angiogenesis. They're also working with chefs to create recipes that use optimal anti-angiogenic ingredients in tasty, accessible ways. And of course, researchers are exploring how digital tools, social networks, and community engagement can help spread this information because prevention is most powerful when people can use it daily and not only in a clinical setting. Understanding angiogenesis gives us a completely new lens to view disease, diet, and everyday health decisions. It reminds us that our bodies are constantly building, pruning, and repairing the networks that keep us alive. And that supporting those systems may help us reduce the risk of cancer, support metabolic health, and maintain long-term wellness. The more we learn about angiogenesis, the more we realize that this hidden network plays a role not just in disease, but in how we can take charge of our health in small but meaningful ways. And as research continues to evolve, we'll gain even clearer insight into how the choices we make can help keep this system in balance. I'm Dr. Angio. If you want more weekly videos breaking down the science of your blood vessels and how they influence cancer, metabolism, and everyday health, make sure to subscribe. There's so much more to discover about the power inside your own body, and I'm excited to explore it with you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.